Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Tim passed along a story about an attorney who got in trouble. And there's a question about what it takes to get back into the practice of law once you've been kind of kicked out. And um, people ask me stuff, you know, about how the bar works and so on. And this is always interesting to see the inner workings of the bar. But this is from the ABA Journal. Again, uh, Deborah Cassens Weiss wrote the article, Lawyer can't be reinstated to law practice unless he shows his wife has no access to the accounts. And the accounts we're talking about are the accounts of the law practice, <laughs> not the husband's. A New Jersey lawyer has to show proof that his wife no longer has access to the accounts, books, or records of his law firm before he can be reinstated after a three-month suspension, according to the New Jersey Supreme Court. And people ask me about that. Whenever we hear stories about attorneys who get in trouble, they always talk about the Supreme Court ruling on stuff. And, And usually when you hear about a Supreme Court ruling on a case, it's because a case has been appealed so many times. But in many states, Michigan's the same way. The Supreme Court has the final say on disciplinary issues with respect to attorneys. So it's not been appealed a whole bunch of times. It's just that's who who makes these decisions. So apparently the same thing is true in New Jersey. The state Supreme Court suspended the attorney in an April 9th order that rejected a longer six-month suspension sought by the court's disciplinary review board. So the disciplinary review board had suggested a six-month suspension, but the Supreme Court shortened it. But here's the thing. According to the disciplinary review board, The attorney unreasonably relied on his wife's secretarial and bookkeeping help in his law practice, even after problems came to light. As a lawyer, he was responsible for overseeing her actions. And so if I run a law office and I hire people to work for me, I have clients who bring me cases, I work on the cases, and occasionally the people in my office might help me. I have to make sure the people who help me behave appropriately whether they're working on documents or working on the file or doing something or handling the money of clients. That's often where the problems come from. According to the review board, Gonzalez failed to review his trust account, which would have shown shortages that were due to his wife's errors. Most attorneys um, have what they call an interest-only lawyer's trust account in Michigan. It's called an IOLTA. But most states, they have something similar to that where if you get money in, and it's a settlement check. And some of it's mine because it's an attorney fee. And some of it's yours because it's your, you know, the result of the lawsuit. When the check comes in, it's often made out to both of us. That's what they do. So I take the money. I put it in my trust account. I then send you your check and I cut myself a check. But the account is not mine. It's a trust account. Meaning that, that you know, that's exactly what it's designed to do. It's designed simply to, to allow us to apportion the money like that. So apparently there were shortages in the trust account, and that's never a good thing. The attorney had hired an accountant to prepare reconciliations of his trust account after a 2005 audit. He was unaware that his wife had stopped sending the account the necessary records. In one case, his wife drafted a trust account check for a lawsuit settlement before the firm received the proceeds, which is also a no-no. In another, she misplaced a settlement check. And in a third, she failed to send a settlement authorization to the opposing party, then drafted a check to the client for settlement proceeds that weren't received. Again, another problem. The wife also prepared false account statements to hide errors, didn't disclose a fee arbitration matter to the attorney, and hid from her husband two ethics grievances that had been filed against him, the review board said. Okay, it's one thing for her to make mistakes. It's another thing for her to try to cover up the mistakes. And it's even worse for her to try to hide the ethics grievances that have been filed against them. The review board noticed a psychologist's uh, report that his wife's mental state had suffered after her father's death, and she began hiding problems to avoid conflict. Uh, The attorney had no prior record of discipline in 22 years of practice. The review board also noted letters from individuals attesting to his good character and a plaque given to him by a grateful client. (laughs) <laughs> no clients ever give me a plaque, so I guess this guy's doing well. Four members of the review board had sought a six-month suspension. Three others recommended a three-month suspension. And another simply thought the man should be censured. Uh, and that's where you basically just publicly admonish him, to use another big word. Um, the ABA Journal had attempted to contact the attorney to ask him for his side of the story, but they were unable to get a hold of him. So um, it's, it's one of those stories where it sounds like there were problems, and I'm not trying to belittle whatever problems the wife may have had, but it is the job of the attorney 
to oversee what's happening in his name or her name. And so when I am an attorney, you come to me, you hire me, I'm representing you in court. I file documents to the court say, I represent this person. I am their attorney, okay? Like I said, other people might touch that file in my office. It could be a secretary. It could be another attorney. Uh, I've, had a, I've had situations where there's a hearing that's not that important, like a status conference type thing, and, I've, and I've, I can't make it. Another attorney will cover for me. That attorney will go into court. You know? But I make sure that those people who are doing that, those tasks for me, they're still representing me in how I represent you. And so if I have somebody else handling stuff, I oversee it because I understand that they don't get in trouble if they screwed up. I do. Okay? Now, I've, I've heard stories about guys who are so busy, had such huge practices, were making so much money, that they couldn't keep track of it all. At that point, you either need to back it off a little bit or hire better help, but it's still no excuse. And so I can tell you that in Michigan, um, if you have a trust account, okay, and a big check comes in, million-dollar check comes in, and you take the million-dollar check, you stick it in your trust account. And let's suppose that uh, most of it's going to the client, small portions coming to me for my fees or my costs. So I'm going to cut the client a check and myself a check when this money clears, right? If I cut the check and send it to my client and say, just hang on to that check, I'll let you know when it's good. If the client runs to the bank and tries to negotiate the check before the check is good, even though I told them not to, if they do that and the check doesn't clear, the bank is required by state law to notify the bar association that a trust account check written by an attorney didn't clear. And check would be good a day later, two days later, whatever it is. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's the same as a lot of this. I mean, this, this is something that's listed as one of the things that attorneys can't do. You can't cut someone a bad check. And by definition, the check is bad. And so if that happens, okay, you get a nasty letter from the bar and it says, we understand you wrote a bad check. Explain. And they don't they don't accept just simply, oh, I thought the check would be good two days later. I told my client not to. They run you through the ringer. I, I know many attorneys who've described this process. And, and, and I can tell you when the process changed because everything, because it was not uncommon for an attorney to tell a client, look, you're in my office and I'm going to hand you the check. Just you can't negotiate it for three days, four days, whatever it is. And once in a while, they get ants in their pants. And they are very, very specific about this now, that, that if you have the check and you cut it, hang on to it until it's good, then hand it to your client. And if your client's crying, I want the money now, you say, you can't have the money now. And, and, and that's, you know, that's the thing. So that's on the attorney. So if these things are happening on his watch, it's on him. You know, the question is whether it's six months, three months, a censure, whatever the punishment is, you know, that's, that's not for me. That's above my pay grade, as we say. But the real point is that this stuff happened on his watch. It is his responsibility. So he was going to get a suspension. But first, he's got to convince the panel that he's going to solve the problem. The problem being he had someone handling this stuff who clearly couldn't handle it. Whether they had a good reason to or not doesn't matter. That's, again, that's on him. Okay? She's working for him, but <laughs> the buck stops with him. So there you go. Uh, Tim, thanks for the story, the ABA Journal, and of course, Deborah Cassis Weiss. Talk to you later. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. We generate fears while we sit, we overcome them by action.